Thank you, Clarissa. Grab your Bible and open to 1 John chapter 2. We'll be in verse 28 today as we're continuing our series in the book of 1 John. And so if you haven't uh, been here for any of the other sermons, don't worry. I'll get you caught up and you'll know kind of where we are and what we're doing in there. So 1 John chapter 2, 20, verse 28, grab a Bible around you, your scripture journal uh, that we have passed out in what past weeks or... Uh, grab your phone, whatever you need to do to get your eyes on a page. We'll be looking at the English Standard Version, um, but I'm just happy for you to have your eyes on any page, any version. So, all right. Um, As we look into 1 John this week, as we come along, we're in our sixth sermon. I always think about how do I open the sermon in a way that sort of helps you grasp tangibly what we're going to be talking about for today. Uh, Today's sermon is about purity. Now, that word has all kinds of meanings to you, and it probably doesn't mean what you think it means. (laughs) But when I was thinking about purity, I thought about, first thing is pure water. Pure water. Uh, You know, like this is a very common thing for us today, is getting a bottle of purified water. And, And they love to tell you about how pure the water is that you're drinking what kind of filtration or what natural spring it's from, or it's from the mountains flowing down, and, uh, and, and we drink pure water. I'm thinking about, really, in, in the last 20 years, what a change this is. I mean, I remember if, if my dad were alive, he would just be scoffing at this concept of, why would you pay money for a bottle of water when you can go to the sink and get it out of the tap? Uh, I, I, he would just die if he knew that last, a week ago Friday night, I took my boys to an iCubs game and I paid $4.50 for a bottle of water. Like, it just, he would be appalled by this. And I, I was too. Uh, he'd just be like, Dad, you know, you're crazy. In fact, I said, can you fill this back up after we drank it? They were like, no, you can buy a new one. And she actually told me at, the, at the, um, the little vending station where I asked her to fill it up, she goes, the only place I have to fill it is the hand washing station. And I don't think you want water from the hand washing station. Why? That's a great, why? Because we're obsessed with pure water. No, nobody wants it that it's gross, like, like this kind of water here. No one wants to drink that, right? Like, you don't want that. That's, it, it's gross. It's filled with who knows what and where it came from. I can remember when I was a kid in elementary school, there was this one kid in my class, there would always be a drinking fountain line. We'd get up and get in line for the drinking fountain, and somehow this kid would end up always right before me, and I would watch him put his whole mouth over the water spigot, you know? (laughs) Even then, when I didn't understand, I thought, that's gross and weird. Don't do that. All right. Pure. The simple idea that all the bad stuff, the stuff that doesn't belong, has been removed. That's what purity has an idea. That if we had one key verse from today, it would be in chapter 3, verse 3, where it says uh, this, Any, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I got some questions when I read that verse. First of all, what hope is he talking about? Everyone has hopes. What, what hope is he talking about? And what is pure? Pure from what? And, and who is pure? And how do I purify myself? And what does this all mean? Well, good thing that uh, we're going to look at this together today. Hopefully we'll answer some of those questions. But there's a simple idea. I often tell you to remember one thing because I, I know you're only going to remember one thing from this. And, uh, and it's this. Uh, God is pure light. His children should live according to righteousness. God is pure light. His children should live according to righteousness, according to purity. God is light. If you're his child, live in the light. God is pure. If you're his child, live in purity and righteousness. We've been in, the, in this um, epistle, this letter of John to his church for six weeks now, and I just remind you every time, John, this is the Apostle John writing. He followed Jesus. He was maybe perhaps the youngest disciple, maybe. Um, there's some speculation of that, but he was a young teenager probably when he's following Jesus. And now he's an old man, and he is the pastor of this church, 
And as I remind you, every week this church had just gone through a church split, and they are struggling. And John writes to these various churches in this region over which he's the pastor. He writes to them it, it, with a heart of a pastor because he loves his little children. And he knows that this church split has been painful for them. It's been tough. And John is a really good pastor. And so he frames his epistle. He wants to reassure his children who remain in, in the church. And he wants to address the heresy that those people have left, who have left are still trying to lead people astray with. And so he says two things. God is light and God is love. And that's our big outline for the book. God is light. God is love. He structures this with an introduction. He moves on to God is light. He moves on to God is love. And then he ends the time with just a simple conclusion. So it's a very simple structure for his letter. And today we're actually finishing section one, God is light, which is why I've pulled the word light into the title today and talking about pure light. In recent sermons, we've seen weeks one to five that God told us to live in the light and believe the right things about Jesus, that he is fully God and fully man. Today, in this last section of a uh, sermon in section one, we're going to see that God is light, which means he is pure, and we should live like his children. God is pure light, his children should live according to righteousness. And so, like John often does, he says, this is who you are, and this is what you should do. It's a very simple outline. In fact, I have used that outline multiple times in 1 John already. This is who you are, this is what you should do. And that forms our two points today. Who are you? You are a child of the righteous one. Who you are should impact how you live. You are a child of of the righteous one. That's the first thing I want you to know today. And so let's look at our text as we look at this first point together. Verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. Now, you see that word abide there. John is linking us to last week's sermon. Uh, Last week we left it, we left it with just as he has taught you, uh, abide in him, remain in him, stick around. That was the point from last week. And John just links us right to that same thought. He says, and now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are the reason why the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know him beloved we are god's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is and everyone who has thus hope who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure The first thing we get, this idea of remaining in confidence. And now, little children, verse 28, abide, remain in him. Be confident in who you are in Christ. Don't be ashamed when he comes back. Well, well, how how will I not be ashamed? I mean, if you stop and think about God Almighty in the person of Jesus coming back, the judge of the universe, and standing before him, you could think, man, I might tempted, be tempted to be ashamed when his purity reveals my impurity. He says, don't be ashamed. Why? How, how can I stand confidently? He says, practice righteous living. If you know, verse 29, that he is righteous, you can be sure that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Jesus is coming back, and if you have placed your faith in him, if you believe that Jesus is God Almighty, who came to be one of us, who died in our place for our sins, who was raised for the dead, and is doing this incredible kingdom work in our midst through us, and that we have this glorious hope of the full restoration of the kingdom of God in this future when he comes back. We have, if you're, if you're holding on and clinging to this, if you believe this simple gospel message, then you're a child of God, and he's coming back. And when he comes back, you don't have to be ashamed. 
If you are reborn in the family of God, um, another language that we often use is adopted into God's family. But John likes the, the word rebirth, this idea of rebirth. But you, the idea is you've become a child of the Almighty God, the Father. You are His child. Um, if, if this is true, then you should live according to the principles of the Father into whose family you've been adopted or reborn. That way, when he comes back, you won't be ashamed. When I was 17 years old, as a junior in high school, my mom and my dad, dad had a business trip in Europe, and mom and dad uh, went together. And so they flew off to Scotland, and they left me, a junior in high school, home alone. My brother was off to college. I think it was me and the dog. And you know what? Uh, I, they pounded it into my head that they were trusting in me to be responsible. And I, I got this, right? Like I felt the weight of it, the weight that they placed upon me to, to be responsible. And so uh, they left me home for eight days and it went great. Got myself to school on time, got myself to work on time, did, all, did the whole day, left me a whole list of things that needed to be done, did them all, dog didn't die, like it was great. And when the day came for them to come home, I remember being excited. I was excited to say, look, I did everything you asked. I lived like you wanted me to when you were gone. And they came home, and I was not at all ashamed. I was excited to see them. A year later, my senior year of high school, dad has another business trip to Scotland. They go again. They leave me with the same instructions, but now I'm a senior, and like many seniors, my head is, go like, I lost my head. Like, I don't know where it went. Like, it's happened to many 17 year, 18 year olds. You just lose your mind. If you're 17 or 18 year old, you don't know it yet, but you lost your mind, okay? And so you'll realize it later. Uh, and so they go, and like, I think, I, I got this. Same instructions, same deal. I had a party at my house while my parents were gone. And my friends, they were good kids, right? We didn't do anything crazy, but we had a party. And I remember a couple of my friends got out of hand. Mom, mom, mom will tell you this is true. Uh, they were running around my house like crazy. They slammed into the bathroom door and busted it down the middle, right? And so, like, the, frame, the door frame of the bathroom is busted. And nothing ends a party sooner like you are dead, right? Like, all, all my friends were, like, disappeared. Just boom, they were gone. And I'm left standing there in the door frame, trying to think about how can I glue this together so my parents will never know, right? Like right out of the Brady Bunch. And so I'm trying to figure this out and I, I'm holding some like splinters and pieces and, and then I just drop them. I go, my parents come home in three days. Three days. Three days of dread. I was ashamed for their coming. Because I knew that I had not lived according to the principles that they set out. I was ashamed. I did not act with the best interests of our family in mind. I did not act like a Brooks. I acted like a teenager who lost his mind. John's point is this. All these people have abandoned the church. Because they went out in this new secret knowledge, this new system of thought that they had. They went out with their, you know, like freedom to just live and do whatever they want, whenever they want. And they weren't living like a child of God. And John says, that's because they aren't. But you are. Live like it. And then in this great pastoral moment, John, in the tenderness of of his heart, just pauses, and it's almost like a, like a parenthesis. He's like, almost jots this side note. Hey, I don't want you, he says to his children, to sit there going, oh, I'm terrified. I don't know, what else? Am I a child of God? Am I not? What am I? He says, no, 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 no. How great. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And just in case they wonder, that is what you are. And so we are. We are children of the Almighty God. This is, is this great love that God had. He said, I would give myself for you. That's how much I love you. 
It is a privilege to be God's child. You are lavished in his love. And this is quite an honor, and I don't think most of the time we even grasp it or realize it, that we are royalty because we are children of the king if we believe and have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. If you have done that, you have been adopted and you are royalty. But so many times we're like uh, Prince Harry and Meghan who kind of would rather not be royalty. They like all the perks of royalty, like a lot of money, but none of the responsibility. It's too much weight. We're like, we just forget what a, most of the average person in England would look at them and go, are you crazy? Do you know what you have? You're, you're royalty. You're a child of the king. Have you forgotten what you have? The world doesn't know us, he says in the text in verse 1. Because being a child is a hard thing. Jesus said, no servant's greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus says, they're going to persecute you. Yeah, the world doesn't get it, and they don't know you. They don't recognize you as royalty, but that is what you are. And there's this great reward, because Jesus is coming back. The, weir- the word appears, um, actually appears, six times in our text today, five that are very obvious, and one that's a little bit hidden. Um, but it appears six times. The first three are all forward-looking. If you look at the text, uh, chapter 3, verse 2, we know what we will be has not yet appeared. Excuse me, uh, the first one's in verse 28, sorry. So that when he appears, verse uh, 2 of chapter 3, what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears. Those are the first three in in our first section. They're all future looking here appears jesus is coming back then in in chapter 3 verse 2 the appears is we're coming back too because we will be revealed we will appear and then in the second half i love this idea we know that when he appears we will be like him there's hope for us coming back i i love all this the point is that the resurrection Jesus return, he, he's alive today, and he's coming back. And when he is revealed, when he comes back, you're going to be changed. I, so many times we think the hope of the resurrection is simply, merely eternal life. As if that's a small thing, right? But we forget the great hope is that it's not eternal life like we are now. It's eternal life changed. Whatever mess you're in, whatever thing you've done, whatever thing you do over and over again, the thing you do that makes you go, am I really a child of God? How could I be acting like this? It'll be changed. If you realize how broken you are, I mean, that's part of the gospel. As you come to Jesus, you go, I'm broken. If you realize how broken you are, you have three choices with how to respond to that in your heart. One is just despair. I am so broken and so messed up, there is no hope for me. The second response is denial, right? Like, I just choose to believe I'm not broken because it's the thought of how broken I am, so overwhelming. Let's just call it not broken and be okay with that. Um, Went to the dentist a couple weeks ago. um, She came in, told me that uh, I have a tooth in the back of my mouth that is so bad it has to be pulled. And, and she said, when do you want to schedule this? And I said, well, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Let's just pretend that you didn't say that. <laughs> she goes, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm Dave. Who are you again? Like, <laughs> like we'll just pretend. It. So I, I literally walked out. She was dumbfounded. But like, this is, sounds terrible. I would rather not admit that I have a problem. That is way easier. I know what you're going to think. You're you're thinking that uh, I'm going to end back up at the dentist, and you might be right, but let's just pretend that we're not talking about this, okay? (laughs) Denial. When you realize how broken you are, you can deny that there is a problem. Or the third thing you can do is you can change. You can change and be transformed. The Christian says, I am a mess, mess, 
but I will change now, and one day I will be completely and utterly changed. I, this verse gets me so excited. It, it gets me so excited to see that. Uh, beloved, verse 2, <laughs> we're children now. What we will be has not yet appeared, for we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we'll see him as he is. When you look at the resurrected Jesus in the Gospels, we get this clue, this hint of what a restored physical body was always supposed to be like. Because Adam and Eve messed it all up for all of us. When sin entered the world, we're all broken. Whatever physical problem you have, it's sin. It's a result of all the brokenness that we have. But the hope that John gives us here is that one day you're going to see Jesus and you will be changed and all your emotional brokenness brokenness will be healed and all your physical brokenness will be healed and all the garbage that you deal with will be healed and you'll be like Jesus because you are a child of him. There have been so many times where I've just cried out, Jesus, I can't take my sin nature anymore. I just, I'm so broken. Come, Lord Jesus, I long to be made. I long to be pure, even as he is pure. Everyone thus, who thus hopes in him, verse 3, purifies himself as he is pure. There's a passive and an active aspect to being purified. The passive aspect acknowledges that you can't do anything. You are helpless, and it has to be God working in you. And yet, we still have a human responsibility. We have to say, God, I will let you change me by saying no to the flesh and saying yes to the Spirit. God is pure. You are pure because you are his child, and yet you are becoming pure, and you will be pure. It's this past, present, future. Jesus died to make you pure. You are in right standing with him. You are being purified right now. You should look more like Jesus than you did a week ago. And you are going to be made whole and perfect. It's this aspect of our salvation. We keep fighting to be pure, knowing that in the future we will be completely like him. Don't let Satan make you doubt your status as a child of God. That is what you are. And don't quit trying to be pure. God is pure, only he can do this, and he will be doing this in you. Who are you? You are a child of the righteous one. You are pure, and you are becoming pure. That is who you are. Now, I said there are two things. What do you do with that? This is what is true about you. You are his child if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. This is who you are. How should you now live? And that's the second thing. Well, you should practice righteousness. If you are a child of the righteous one, you should, in fact, practice righteousness. If you are a child of him, you should not sin. John moves from reassurance now to conviction. I, I love that he does this. He goes back and forth. He says the, the kind, reassuring thing that we need to hear in that moment where our hearts just need to engage. And then he goes, oh, by the way, Let's talk about how you can become pure because you got issues. And just when you're feeling like you can't go on and you can't stand up the, under the weight of the conviction, then John goes back and he goes, but I want to remind you of who you are. You're a child of God. I just love his pastoral heart in, in, his, in his epistle here. John wants to move from reassurance to conviction now. He's going to say the hard thing. And so this second part, I want to read it, but as you read it, it's structured around this phrase, practice of sinning. You're going to see it three times. Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning, there's the first one, and it's always coupled with a practice of righteousness. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. For whoever practices righteousness is righteous 
as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning, there's the second one, is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes, and here's the third one, practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he is born of God. He's been born of God. Verse 10, by this it is evident, there's our hidden word, it's the same word, appeared. This is evident, who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Do you notice a significant change in tone here? He's just said, I want you to know you're a child of God, but I need you to know and understand that all of those who left us are in this practice of sinning. Let's talk about that. The first practice of sinning is in verse 4. And he says, what is this? Well, the practice of sinning here is lawlessness. He's not necessarily referring to the Mosaic law, the law of the Ten Commandments. He's referring to here a general practice of rebellion against God. This is God, I refuse to do it your way, I will do it my way. I mean, this is the great rebellion of Satan. He said, I will not submit to God, I want to be God. This is the great rebellion of Adam. He said, I will not submit to God, I will do my own thing. This is the great rebellion in 1 John, who these people who had left it said, uh, sin isn't a thing. We're in charge of deciding what's sin and what's not. This is the re- great rebellion of our day. Sin isn't a thing. I'll do it my own way. The practice of sin is lawlessness or rebellion. But what happened? Verse 5. You know that he, Jesus, appeared. Now we're in the past tense. Now he's talking about not the future hope of Jesus appearing, but the first time Jesus appeared. When he came as a baby and he grew up and he lived here on earth. And he spread out his arms and died for us. That appearance. And he said, this is the past, this is about the cross. And he, John says to them, you don't have to be, to to deny your sin. You don't have to live in rebellion. You can be forgiven of it. And so he says, no one keeps on sinning. John has in mind here, the person who no longer cares that they are sinning. This is an unrepentant person. The person who makes a practice of sin is denying that it's rebellion against God. I deny that there is a God. Or God's, or they will say God's highest goal is that I would be happy. God's highest goal is that everything would be about me. So I can do and live however I want. If you're a child of God, you say, no, 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 no. My life is not my own, and I gladly and joyfully submit to the God of the universe who gave his life for me because I'm his child. So you don't make a practice of sinning because you don't want to be living in rebellion. The second phrase, the practice of sinning, you'll find in verse 7 and verse 8. Verse 7, whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Um, pra- the practice of sinning in the second instance is the act of the devil. So the first practice of sinning is the rebellion, and Satan is the chief rebeller. The second practice of sinning is actually the acts or the works of Satan now. John has in mind two roads. Road number one is a road that is tied and tries to seek the things of God. Road two is the road that is tied and tries to seek the things of the devil. John's so black and white. You're either this or you're this. There are no other options. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. There's our fifth use of this word, appeared. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The acts of sin... Anyone who continues practicing sin is of the devil, and Jesus came to defeat and destroy the devil. The practice of sin hurts you, and the practice of sin hurts other people. In the current culture we live in, it says, live however you feel best. 
But that's often self-destructive. Because that's just simply based on feelings. My f- it's not based on anything else but feelings. The way I feel that makes me live best is best for me. The problem is that's living in rebellion and it's actually harmful to you. Being a slave to your feelings to sin will always harm you. That is what Satan does. If you are a slave to your feelings, you are being harmed. See, the thing is, you know that firsthand how someone else's sin hurts you. You just don't always feel how your sin hurts other people. But you know firsthand that sin is destructive. If someone else has hurt you, you feel the shame or pain of that. And maybe you still have that hurt. Maybe you're still mopping up the consequences in your life. And that's the effect of sin. The works of the devil are destructive. Don't do that stuff, John says. Jesus came to destroy it. The practice of sinning is the act of the devil. And then the last time this phrase is used in our text is verse 9. No one born of God or adopted, the other phrase, makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. If you are denying your sin, if sin is a way of life, John says you're not a child of God. And this is where it gets a little scary. The practice of sinning, this repeated, unrepentant, living in rebellion, denying God, John says, Somehow, he says that if this is your way of life, you're not a child of God. And John has such cut and dry language. I would prefer a more nuanced approach. (laughs) I would like, well, you know, like, hold on. Let's have a little compassion here. And like, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't like like this or this. I don't like black and white. I like to acknowledge that there's a, like a whole bunch of different nuances um, between there, I was going to say shades of gray, but we got to be careful with that phrase now. So uh, there's all kinds of different stuff going on in between. I'd like a more nuanced approach, but John is very careful here. And he was saying, listen, if you are living in constant rebellion against God, you, you are not his child. And you have no reason to be reassured of this. That's tough. John is dealing with people who are out to destroy his children And he wants to ask, are they really born of God? Then if you are, you should engage in your battle with sin. And then he uses this last word, appear. Verse 10, by this it is evident who are the children of God. For the first time, this is not about Jesus appearing. You know, he says Jesus is coming back and, and, and his appearance will change you. And Jesus came And his appearance provided forgiveness of sins. But now he uses this word, the same word, and it's present tense, and it's not about Jesus, it's about us. This is how, how can I phrase this and use the the word? By this it, it is evident, by this it has become apparent. In other words, you'll appear if you're really a child of God. Jesus appeared, but now you and I are appearing. Children of God, do what's right, stop doing what's wrong, because if you are stuck in a life of unrepentant sin, you've got to ask yourself a really hard question. John forces you to here. If you are in a life of unrepentant sin where you are denying sin and its consequence, when you're saying, I am my own determiner of sin, If you are living there, you have to ask yourself. John forces you to ask this question. And this this is one of the more terrifying verses in the Bible. This is the verse that if we didn't go through uh, (laughs) a book like this, I might just skip this verse. Because this is terrifying. Like, I don't want you guys to leave here and be terrified. But it is terrifying. Verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is from the devil. Verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For the repeat offender, this is scary. For the person with an addiction, this is terrifying. (laughs) 4, if I continue, 
I mean, let's just hypothetically speaking, if you continue to live and be a gluttonous person, does that mean I don't know him? If you keep gossiping over and over again and you see the destruction in your life so much that you're like, ha, ah, I'm frustrated, I can't stop gossiping. Does that mean you don't know him? If you continue to sin over and over, will you be forgiven? This is where we've got to look at John's epistle in its whole to answer these questions. Because John's primary concern here is the person who continues sinning and says, I refuse to accept the notion or the concept of sin. I will live any way I want. And God will affirm me rather than me affirming God. Because 1 John 1, 9 comes to bear. For those of us who have done the same thing over and over, like the Apostle Paul who says, I know the thing I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it. For you, the promise is there. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive your sins. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so this is the deal. The person who keeps on sinning is denying any sin in his or her life. But the person who confesses and goes, God, I'm a mess. I'm broken. I did it again and again and again. That's called living in a repentance life. And the promise is that Jesus' blood is sufficient for you. If you don't admit there's a problem, why do you need forgiveness? If you can ask the question, am I stuck in a pattern of unrepentant sin? I think you are on your first step towards repentance. You can only do this by the Holy Spirit, and the child of the devil, devil would never even ask the question. And so there is this great hope for those of us who look at ourselves and see the brokenness in our lives. And the great hope is that just seeing the brokenness, just finding and stepping in repentance all over again, he cleanses us. And thereby would prove that we are children of God. That is what we are. You are a child of the light. And if you are in Christ, you are loved. So as I wrap up here, just two thoughts. First of all, how do you embrace it? How do you need to embrace that you are a loved child of God? If you have placed your faith in him, if you have been forgiven, and if you are continually saying, Jesus, I am broken and need you to purify me and to change me. If that is you, how do you need to embrace your status as a child of God? Do you need to, <laughs> for, for the person who spends so much time hating themselves, you need to realize that God doesn't hate you. For the person who sees their sin over and over, you need to know that God looks at you and lavishes his love on you. For the person who has never felt loved, you need to know that you are. And if you've never felt like you belong, you need to know that you belong here in the family of God in Christ Jesus. You are a child of the light. God is light. And once you've embraced this, once you've embraced that you're a child of the light, then the next step is live like it. Live in repentance. I want to know what do you need to repent of today? I think we'll just go around and let each person share. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just to make everyone really uncomfortable. Um, what do you need to repent of? I mean, you've probably got a laundry list. Do you? I do. A laundry list of stuff. I'm constantly, um, when, when we were taking communion today, um, I was examining my heart. Paul tells us to do that. And the Lord just brought to mind on uh, my life just this one particular thing thing. Oh. I don't know that I ever looked at that as a sin before, the thing he brought to me, but it, it was just not living to the commands of Jesus, and I repented, and I confessed, and then the, in my mind, I thought, how do I, what do I do now? I'm still chewing on that. Like, this is the great hope of the forgiveness of Christ. What do you need to repent of? Maybe it's a simply fear. John has one specific thing in mind. The last verse, the last phrase. What do you need to repent of? Um, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, 
Then he's going to give a very specific example. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. What is keeping you from living in righteousness? John has in mind that you're not loving your brother or sister in Christ. Is it an attitude of hard-heartedness or anger against one of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it an inability to forgive someone who is your brother and sister in Christ, but you just can't forgive them? Is it an inability to understand the implications of God's grace in your life? In other words, I've been forgiven, but yet I can't forgive my sister in Christ. Are you sidetracked and angry about something that isn't even essential to the gospel, and it's keeping you from loving your brother or sister? Quit running around, living in unconfessed sin. Quit hating your brother. You are a pure child of God, so embrace it. And so this is the great hope. If you are a child of God, that is what you are. Live like it. I end with this story, and if you have little kids, you can relate to this. Um, you, you guys know I have a lot of kids. They're spanning many ages, 23 to 8. Uh, and at one point, we had four kids under the age of five in our house. And so a little insane, um, we survived it. Um, but I remember at one point, Clarissa's like holding a newborn and we got all these kids everywhere and, and it's summer and they're outside and they come in at the end of the day and they are dirty. Like, you know that kid stink that comes when they've been sweating all day and throwing mud at each other and who knows what else because the dog pooped out there and who knows what's on them, right? Like, it's just gross. And so... We came in, and it's an arduous ordeal to get these four kids under the age of five in the tub and out of the tub and cleaned and bathed, and, uh, and, and, and then you get it all done, and I'm totally exhausted, and it's a moment where I can't wait till they're asleep so I can collapse. But this is the moment where they're all clean and they come out of the tub. Like, this is when I want to hug a kid, you know? Like, this is the moment I want to snuggle in with this clean kid, and so we're getting them all done, and I got all four cleaned, and... Uh, ready and uh, and then where's the three-year-old like can't find the three-year-old it's not we don't have a big house it's, it's times tiny little house we can't find this three-year-old anywhere i'm like i'm like where is the three-year-old look around the whole house can't find the three-year-old so finally i look out back and they're in the backyard in the sandbox where, you know, I don't know what cats do to sandboxes, but they're gross just in general, right? And he is covered in gross slime and who knows what mud and sand, and it's everywhere. And I go, oh, I just cleaned you. Like, I just had you perfectly clean. What are you doing? You're clean. Act like it. And I just think that you and I are sometimes just like a three-year-old, aren't we? We're just like a three-year-old. We are pure children of the living God. How do you need to act like it today? Holy Spirit, we ask you to convict us and change us and transform us. We are children of the living God if we have placed our faith in Jesus. We are part of your family, and we are pure even as we are becoming pure. And would you... Change us and make us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.